Oh, hey everybody, how are we all doing today? Uh, well, uh, it's still technically 2023. Uh, we're not quite done with it yet. We still got a few more days to slog on through, but do not worry. We can make it to the finish line to 2024, where I'm sure things will be better because that's how years work, right? That's how time works in general. But you know, what is time after all, really? You know, I mean, it, it, it does it exist? Um, do, do you exist? Do I exist? Am I in limbo right now? Are we in the matrix? I have no idea of knowing. Uh, I guess we could be. This this tablet in front of me right now, that might not exist. It's okay though. It's alright. If you need grounded for something, I can tell you that much. At least we know that Beppo is real. And he is right next to me. Oh, thank God. Beppo. Alright, so... Oh boy, all right, you know, sometimes, Beppo, I have a little bit of an existential crisis and, and question my own existence, but just thank everything that you are here next to me right now so I know that this is real. Okay, all right, we're ready to go now. Okay, just, just remember, <laughs> whenever you're having doubts, just turn to your left and see a giant polar bear wearing a boiler suit, and you'll know you're in reality. All right, this is One Piece, chapter 1103, titled, I'm So Sorry, Daddy. That's, that's literally the title of the chapter. I'm so sorry, Daddy. All right, is this the one where Bonnie dies? We already had a old flashback where Kuma slowly dies, and then now there's, this is the one where the capstone, where Bonnie dies, and his whole family is just wiped off the map. Why not, right? So this is, this is going to be a little confusing, all right? So we just got done with the flashback involving Kuma, all right, when he was transformed into a pacifista where he effectively died, okay? Now that was right before the war at Marineford, okay? Because Kuma was still Kuma at Sabaody, then he sent all the Straw Hats flying, and then he got turned into PX0, and then at Marineford he was that, you know, that entity. He had lost all humanity and his emotion and memories at that point, right? So now we are cutting two years into the future, but not quite at the present storyline. We are cutting to the night before at Egghead when they were still fighting the Seraphim, and we still don't know exactly how that went down, but you know how we had that time skip when we just cut to like the next day and the Seraphim are all contained in the bubbles? So this is during that. The way that the sky looks, and it's, it's manga, it's black and white, so it's kind of hard for me to tell, but I'm thinking this is kind of dawn right now. You know what I mean? Like, you see the skies over Egghead are, like, shaded a little bit differently than the way Oda really does it for, like, daytime. So, I think it's in a way where, like, this is, like, pretty early in the morning, like, five or six o'clock in the morning, like, the sun is coming up, and so this is when this is occurring. So, Bonnie has just experienced all of the memories in high-def 4K IMAX experience for Kuma's backstory. That's a ride at Disney World that I'm sure I would love. Hey, kids! Can I'll step right up and ride Kuma's memory bubble? It'll make you horribly sad for the, at least the rest of the year, okay? Well, anyway, Bonnie walks out of the room, and she's like, you know, she just spent all night in there crying, basically. She walks out, and she's still like, eh, mm. Uh, and so Vegapunk is there, and he looks out of breath. He looks kind of winded. He's like, oh, gee shucks, Quasar. All right, I've really done it now. Kuma told me not to let you see all those memories, and now I, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so at that point, Bonnie kind of walks over to Vegapunk, and she's all still crying and weepy, and she turns back into a kid, and then she hugs him. And then she's like, I'm sorry, Vegapunk. I'm sorry, Grandpa Vegapunk. I didn't mean to kill you. <laughs> and so that's nice. That's a good moment, you know, because the entire arc up until now, she was like murderous at Vegapunk. And Vegapunk was like, oh, please, Bonnie, stop. You don't understand. And so now she does understand. Um, so... Uh, we have a very nice, charming scene, at least a little bit of a moment where things are not chaotic yet. I'm assuming at this point, the Seraphim have been detained and the bubbles are just, just have been detained. Like, that battle has just ended and Vegapunk has some moments with Bonnie before all the Marines show up at, like, the blockade and everything like that, right? So, they have a moment where Vegapunk gives Bonnie a necklace 
that is a sapphire, but it has like, uh, it, it, it very reminiscent of both Kuma's paw pads and also the sun. I'll throw up a symbol right here of what it looks like. Now you might say that gift is a little strange to give Bonnie because Bonnie, you know, had the sapphire scales that were gonna kill her and then her mother, Ginny, also died from this ailment. So here's a sapphire necklace for your 10th birthday present that Kuma gave Vegapunk to give to Bonnie, okay? Because obviously Kuma wasn't gonna be around for her 10th birthday and they had talked at length about like when you turn 10 we're going to be able to go and travel the world and do all these uh you know amazing things together and then of course that didn't happen now bonnie is 12 years old right now so you know this is a, a present that you know should have been given to her two years ago but just with everything that happened and the chaos and her going out to be a pirate and everything and then her her crew getting captured it just didn't work out that way but anyway yeah it's a sapphire necklace that does make sense why kuma would give this to bonnie because remember uh you know at, at first bonnie was a little self-conscious about the sapphire fire scales on her because the kids in the neighborhood would make fun of her and call her like a vampire and everything and she's like hey I don't get to choose what my face looks like this is just how it is and so Kuma made her feel better by saying oh that's just the jewelry that you have on your face and uh, that's when Bonnie smiled and just like oh yeah and so she has the piercing now but the sapphire necklace it, it reminds her of her father okay even though it was the disease that also killed her mother uh, it reminds her of her father even more I would say and so Bonnie holds it up, and she's like, wow, it glistens just like the sun. We're going to get back to this later in terms of the shape of this necklace. But for right now, just put that on the back burner. There's something else I want to bring up with that later. Well, anyway, Vegapunk says that it's a protective charm that Kuma gave to me to give to you. So here it is. Uh, I can't believe... Uh, now they start talking about Luffy. It's like, honestly, though, I can't believe that kid was able to achieve what he did in just two years' time. And so Vegapunk tells Bonnie about how Luffy is Dragon's son. And so the way Bonnie interprets it is like, oh... So a friend of my dad's son, that's Luffy, huh? Wow, crazy, small world, huh? And so Vegapunk's like, yes, indeed. It's very strange that you both showed up at the same time because remember, one of Kuma's like last thoughts in this world was like handing off the torch, as it were, of like, well, I'm dying now. I'm going to be turned into a PX0, but I can at least say that, you know, my daughter will carry on my legacy, Bonnie, but then also Luffy, who is Dragon's son. Um, he will be the one to save the world. I think when Kuma was, you know, laying back and he was envisioning his whole life, the last thing he saw in his memories before he was completely changed over to a robot was probably Bonnie and probably Luffy. And just like, these are the two people that are going to change the world kind of thing, right? That are going to make this all okay. So Vegapunk is just questioning like, oh, fate is such a strange thing. How, you know, you arrived on the island at the same time Luffy and his crew arrived on the island. Ah, yes, very strange. He also goes on to say, well, a lot has happened since you've been in the paw room. It was stated earlier, she was in the paw room all night experiencing the memories because there were a lot of memories. I mean, that flashback was like, what, like seven, eight chapters. So it took probably all night for her to experience that. And so at this point, Vegapunk, uh, remember last time when, when uh, last time we saw Vegapunk from this context, uh, Bonnie had used the time thrust to turn him into a baby so I'm thinking probably how this went down here oh wait no no he was turned into a baby but then he was captured by York and then thrown in the prison that happened after that yeah so the the timelines of of Egghead are really scattered because not only are we dealing with the different timelines of Egghead like the day before the night and then the day now like present but we also had it broken up with all the other stuff happening in the world with Shanks and Garp and then we also had it broken up with the flashback we just had so you know the timelines of of Egghead are kind of scattered right now but the point is Vegapunk has just, you know, the Straw Hats have saved him, the Seraphim are captured, and so now Vegapunk is like, okay, great, now I have to go find Bonnie. And so he goes finds some Bonnie, gives her the necklace, and is like, listen, uh, the Straw Hat crew just saved me just now, in fact. Okay, I'll explain everything, but we have to meet up with them. So this is going to lead into the scene where the Straw Hats were all hanging out in the command room eating pizza. This is where, as as the Marines were arriving. So that that's what's going to tie into all this. Maybe we got might get more of the flashback, what happened happened the night of, uh, but there's bigger fish to fry, as it were, right now. There's more important stuff going on in the One Piece world, right? So, uh, Bonnie is there and just thinking about what Kuma said to her, like, I'm sorry for everything, Bonnie. Now you know how worthless I am, a mere scientist for hire following his orders. You're wrong. The real villain is, and dot, dot, dot. Now, so remember, 
Yeah, all those letters that Kuma wrote Bonnie, yeah, those didn't get to Bonnie at the time, but now Bonnie has received all of them. All right, so it, it worked out at the end of the day, at least on that front, you know, where like Alpha was ripping up all the all the letters and just like, oh, how how pathetic he would write to his daughter. <laughs> I'm evil. You know what I mean? But at, at least now Bonnie knows everything. She knows everything that Kuma knew about before he died, okay? And so all the letters and everything. So it's like, hey, Vegapunk is not the one that to blame here, it is Saturn. Saturn is the one that, that orchestrated everything. He's the one that basically forced Vegapunk under threat of death to perform this surgery. Vegapunk tried everything he could to like, you know, it's like, oh, I have a, a, an invention that allows you to switch between it or, or okay, I'll install a bomb in Kuma, but do I still have to eliminate his ego? Do I still have to remove who he is? And so Saturn would not bend on this issue at every single moment was just like, nope, you still got to remove his personality. I'm not, I'm not moving on this order. I gave it already, right? Okay. So now, now we are cutting back to the present, the actual present, the present at Egghead. To give you a brief recap on the last time we were here, uh, Saturn has turned into a giant spider demon devil thing. Um, he has now grabbed Bonnie and is crushing her and is holding her aloft so all the other marines in the area are taking aim to uh, shoot her. All right, uh, meanwhile, we also have Frankie and Sanji and Vegapunk, the Stella body, as well as Atlas, who are all present there. However, they are immobilized with um, Saturn's weird eldritch powers that we do not know about yet. Okay, but they, they cannot move. Okay, also, all the Marines that are present are at least Rear Admiral rank or higher. So they're Rear Admirals, Vice Admirals that we've seen, and then one Admiral, which is Kizaru. Speaking of Kizaru and Luffy, they just finished their fight, which kind of effectively ended in a draw. What happened? happened there was that Luffy used the star gun and punched Kizaru right in the face and that knocked him down and then gear fifth ended at that exact moment so Luffy kind of deflated and became, became all shriveled up like an old man so they both hit the ground and so um, you know Kizaru's kind of dazed right now he's got like Tweety Bird over his head right now like cuckoo 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 he's like whoa it's whoa okay I've been I've been high before, but oh, this is going to take a moment. I'm coming down, you know? And then Luffy is just like, ah! He's like a mummy laying on the ground, so they can't really do much of anything right at this moment. We actually do see Luffy there, like, all shriveled up, like, food, please? Someone give me food! And Atlas is the closest to Luffy, and Atlas even looks back and just like, I want to give him food, but I can't move! Okay, so she is immobilized as well. Um, Jewelry Bonnie the Pirate. Your father, Kuma, is truly dead! Alright, so this is where we get to the point in this chapter where Saturn is like, look, Oda essentially had to, he already painted the Tenryu Obito, like the normal Tenryu Obito, like Charlos and Roswald, as horrible individuals, like the worst in One Piece, right? Well, the thing is, the Gorosei are their bosses. They are like the apex of Tenryu Obito. So you really gotta, you, you gotta do something special to make us hate these bastards, you know what I mean? So we already had that earlier in the flashback with all the stuff Saturn said. That would have been enough to cement his fate of like, oh, I want him to die in the most like horrible way possible. Like Kuma lands, grabs Saturn, and then like detonates the bomb or something like something like that. But in this chapter, it just gets added more and more to it, okay? Many people might argue like, oh, he's just doing the villain monologue thing. He's just doing the like, I am evil, and so now I will monologue to you, Bonnie, about how it was all worthless from day one, you know? Saturn says something later in this chapter that basically indicates that every human, essentially, that's not him, he views as an insect. Probably every human that's not him or another member of the Gorosei or Eam, obviously, he views as an insect. This probably even applies to the normal Tenryu Bito, like Charlos and everybody, right? I mean, we've seen the dude's powers. He has literal, like, hell magic powers. You know, humans would be ants to him, right? So it's just like, yeah, I'm just gonna sit here. Like, this is nothing to me. He got stabbed point blank and the wound just healed. So he is very arrogant, but he has the hell magic powers to kind of back that up. Now, of course, there is going, they're all gonna die by the end of One Piece. All the Gorosei are dead by the end of One Piece. But when it comes to regular attacks, they can't do anything to him. And he's like also like 800, 900 years old. So it's like he's basically nigh immortal. And one thing that happens with immortality with characters is they get really arrogant, really narcissistic, really quickly, okay? But I'm not saying that that is a detriment to his character because 
from his perspective, nothing can kill him, you know what I mean? So it's just like, I can do this, so who cares? You know, I'm just gonna revel in the fact that I'm evil, right? Okay, so Sentomaru has been taken into custody. Kizaru is there laying on the ground. He's like, Sentomaru? Bonnie? He's like, he's like coming out of it, right? Like he can't really move yet, but he's like starting to, to move again. Um, we have little shots of all over the world, like outside of Egghead where all the other Marines are stationed, so they can't go into the island. I think they're on the shores of the island or on the boats outside of the island where the, uh, the military siege is going on. So they're like, what's going on? It's like, we don't know. Anybody below Commodore is not allowed in, so we have no idea what's going on. There's people reading the paper all over the world, like the special, like, early morning edition of the World Economic Times is like, oh, what's something's going down at Egghead. Oh man, a Yonko, a Straw Hat Luffy's involved. There's no way they're getting out of this unscathed. And then there's another lady that's like, oh, I hope old man Vegapunk's gonna be all right. Which also indicates that the citizen's opinion of Vegapunk all over the world is probably very positive, right? He's this amazing scientist that have given them so many different pieces of technology. I like to think all of the different anachronistic technology that exists in the One Piece world, like refrigerators and, and ovens and stuff, stoves and lighting and electric lighting and stuff like that. Stuff that won't exist until way later in the timeline and One Piece is like ostensibly supposed to be in like the 1500s, 1600s kind of thing. All this amazing technology is because of Vegapunk, right? So most of the citizens probably love him, okay? Well anyway, we also have Dragon and Ivankov at Kamabaka and Dragon is kind of pacing back and forth uh, and he's like, hmm, assuming there's still a trace of Kuma left in there. What instinct would compel him? Like, where is he going? They're trying to figure out where he went when he left Kamabaka, right? Like, Ivankov, where would he go? Because Ivankov, Dragon, and Kumar are the ones that effectively founded the Revolutionary Army. So it's like, if anybody would know where he would go, it would be them. And so Ivankov is like, hmm, if it was me, I would go to Marijua to get some payback. And then Dragon is like, hmm... Yeah, maybe. And then Eva's like, well, but as we know, Kuma's a little different than that, though. Now, he did go to Marijua, but that was not his final stop. He kept going, and we're going to see what's going to happen later. So, Bonnie is getting crushed by Saturn, but at the last minute, she's just like, okay, you know what? If, if I'm gonna go out anyway, I might as well go out fighting, you know, just like Nika would, just like my dad. I'm gonna do something here. So, she activates her, her distorted future ability to use uh, the Nika future. You know, it was like the giant fist. You know, here comes the giant fist that she used to defeat Alpha. Okay, so she uses that technique against Saturn, and Saturn is just like, what? The sun god? It is like, ah, here comes the giant fist! Oh, it didn't work, okay? And it's like when she went to go use that technique, like her punch kind of just like deflated and was just sort of like, Ooh. And 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 Bonnie is like, what, huh? And it just goes back to normal, and she's like, what? I, I feel so weak again. What what happened here? And so Saturn is like, ah. So you know the name of the sun god as well. Hmm. You truly are Kuma's daughter. Okay, so a couple of things with that. Uh, the name Nika, the sun god, right? That is not a name that is well known throughout the world, okay? Only a certain amount of people know that name. It is sort of a legend that's, you know, uh, passed down between like slaves at Marijuana and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's probably a name that the government tries to suppress as much as possible. Okay, and Saturn kind of like opened his eyes when she said that technique, right? He's just like, wait a minute, what? Okay, and he brings up that Bonnie has yet to make the connection between Luffy and the Sun God. Okay, because the Gumu Gumu no Mi is the, is the name that was like given to Luffy's power originally. They changed the name. It's actually the Hito Hito no Mi model Sun God Nika. It's a mythical zone, but Nobody knows the true name of it. Even Luffy doesn't know the true name of it. Only the government officials like, you know, like Saturn and everybody in the Goro say they knew about the real name, okay? Bonnie also does not know what Nika looks like other than just a vague description given to her by Kuma that he fights, he has a rubbery body, so maybe the connection was made there with Luffy a little bit, but his true form was Luffy's gear fifth. Luffy's awakening form where his whole body goes white, that's the form of Nika. That's the form of the sun god, right? Okay, but Bonnie has yet to make that connection that Luffy has the literal power of the sun god that she and her dad worshipped as a god, okay? Implying 
that if she does figure that out, some cool stuff's gonna happen. As Saturn's lifting up Bonnie and it's just like, hmm, she hasn't made the connection between the Sun God and Straw Hat Luffy yet. He like glances down to see Luffy's body that landed nearby and Luffy's on the ground, still shriveled up, but he's like grabbing a bunch of food around him and just shoving it into his gullet. And Saturn is like, hmm, yeah, she doesn't make the connection between Luffy. Oh, come on, who gave him food? Come on, people. Oh man, could somebody throw some sea stone cuffs on that kid? God, he's the main character of the manga. He's gonna get back up again. All right, it's just like, I love that scene because it's just like, <laughs> it's just like, oh, come on, people. Can we go five seconds without giving the main character food to recharge? Come on. Now, he's like, who gave him food? Who's responsible for this? Because Atlas, Sanji, Vegapunk, and Frankie are all immobilized still. They're still not able to move. So the Marines, they're like, oh, yes, sir, of course. So the Marines all go to rush over to Luffy. We don't see the Marines put sea stone cuffs on Luffy, but they rush over to him, okay? Now we have a shot with Kizaru, who's beginning to get back up again. Like, he was laying flat on the ground, and now Kizaru's kind of, like, getting up. He's, like, leaning against a rock. He's like, okay. Oh, boy. Uh, maybe I should just go into this now. Uh, you know what? I think it probably is the best, best time to mention this now. Okay. I am going to go on a little bit of a tangent, side note, rant thing involving Kizaru, okay? He barely appears in this chapter, but this is a very important discussion that we need to have about Kizaru's character, okay? So the implication here, a lot of people are thinking Kizaru was the one that gave food to Luffy. Because he, like, who else would have been able to do it, you know what I mean? If everybody else, if all the allies and the satellites and the straw hats are immobilized, who else is around to give him food? Centamara was all tied up. We saw him all tied up. So who else? I mean, I guess you could have maybe had, um, I don't know, man. I guess maybe one of the other satellites snuck in and gave some food or something like that, like some other character, maybe. But people are saying it's Kizaru. Okay, here's the thing. Kizaru now has a decision to make. Originally, if you would have said to me, like, oh, Kizaru's going to switch sides and fight on the side of Vegapunk, I was kind of like, ah, I don't see it. Because Vegapunk, you know, he implored with Kizaru, and Kizaru knew uh, Vegapunk and Sentomaru and Bonnie and Kuma and spent so much time with them. And so Kizaru was really like, hey, man, it's just a job, you know? Men like us follow orders. I am an admiral of the Marines. There's like, I am a pillar of this organization. Uh, you know, there's even higher authority than me, you know? Like, the fleet admiral is beyond me, and then Kong is beyond him, and then you have the Gorosei that are my bosses. They're the ones that sign my paycheck, as it were. So, I get an order, I have to go do it. Now, that was very much a case of Kizaru, I think, putting his personal opinions aside for the job. Because he is a military man. He is part of the Marines, right? So he's like, look, I personally don't want to kill Vegapunk and Sentomaru. I really don't want to do this. But my personal opinion of the matter does not is not of concern, right? They were researching the Void Century. They were researching the Poneglyphs. Vegapunk knows that's against the law. So now he has to face the law. That is the law of the world. And that's why I'm here. I'm going to put my personal opinions aside. Okay. That is no longer the situation, Kizaru. All right? That is no longer the way this shakes down, okay? Kizaru is now literally witnessing one of the rulers of the world turn into a giant spider demon and ordering Marines to kill a literal child. All right? I don't think Kizaru or any of these Marines have ever seen this form that Saturn has taken. All right, Saturn, they barely leave the Room of Authority, you know? Like, we saw Saturn at God Valley, so they do leave occasionally, but that was 38 years ago. I mean, who knows the last time they left. But even if they leave Marijua every once in a while, these forms they're going in, this is unusual. This is not a thing that happens, right? Okay. So Kizru, a man who joined the Marines and is very much dedicated to his job and the cause of justice and everything, like, all right, you know, maybe sometimes I have to do things that I don't personally agree with, but hey, it's all for justice at the end of the day. It's kind of hard to argue for justice when one of the rulers of the world turns into a giant spider demon and is like, ah, now, Bonnie, I will crush you. You know, it's just, it, it's kind of hard to follow that. And also, uh, Saturn's going to go into a whole thing here about like, 
experimenting on Bonnie when she was a baby, and uh, the experiments on Ginny that resulted in her death. So Kizaru is learning about all of this here, just like with everybody else, okay? And so I think Kizaru, now more than ever, has to make a decision. Literally, whether to side. Like, this is no longer like... I'm a member of the Marines and all of that kind of jazz. You know, there's a hierarchy, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a pay grade to all this stuff. You know, there's people above me. No, it's not about that anymore. This is now more or less a battle of like good and evil, like biblical, biblically good and evil here. All right. Where you have the sun God and you have an eldritch demon spider thing that crawled out of hell, literally crawled out of hell, made a magic circle that with like black lightning and smoke billowing out of it. Kizaru's like, okay, this, this is not what I signed up for, man. Okay. And, uh, okay. Look at last thing for Kizaru here that I want to see from him in the following chapters. Okay. We already had a long flashback with Kuma, so I'm not saying we have a Kizaru flashback, but what I'm saying is this. We get three panels, three panels from Kizaru's backstory, okay? The first panel is Kizaru when he was a young man joining the Marines, which I'm sure most Marines, when they joined, were there to fight for justice. They were 100% dedicated to the cause, and they're like, pirates are... The, the evil of this world, and I want to make the world a safe and better place for every citizen, okay? So that's the first panel. Just a little panel of Kizaru in his younger days joining the Marines and why he did it. Then a panel of Kizaru meeting Vegapunk for the first time and beginning that friendship. And then the last panel is what we already saw, just Kizaru, Bonnie, Vegapunk, and Sentomaru, just, and, and Kuma, just all hanging out in the lab together, eating pizza, doing the dance, and then just all of that, just three panels for Kizaru, and then he realizes, like, I joined the Marines to fight for good. And I don't know what the hell is going on here, but it's definitely not good. It is, this is evil. Like, Kizaru is not an idiot. He should be able to look at the situation here and unequivocally realize, oh, the Gorosei are evil demons that have ruled the world for 800 years. I have been taking orders, the world government, all of the world government, all of the Marines have been taking orders from actual demons that are immortal for the last 800 years. Okay. Not what I signed up for. I'm on the side of Vegapunk. Also, Vegapunk is captured. Sentomaru is all tied up. I think Kizaru is going to have a moment here where he's going to help everybody get away. And that makes a lot of sense because Kizaru be being able to move at the speed of light, like, how would the Straw Hats have escaped with him there? You know, because he can move super fast. Even if they knock out Kizaru and then get away, as soon as Kizaru wakes back up, zip, he could go right back to them. But if Kizaru becomes their ally, he could help them get away. You know? I think it's time for Kizaru to nut up or shut up. This is the time after. I understand he just got knocked for a loop with like Luffy's star gun. So it's going to take him a while to get back up. And be just, just like with Luffy, it's going to take a while for him to recover. But after Kizaru is like, all right, whoa, okay, I'm back. Then he's going to have to make a decision. And I think he's going to side with Vegapunk and help them all get away. All right, so I, I hope that's with that. I know that's a long little tangent, but I was thinking a lot about this. Even though Kizaru only shows up in like two panels in this chapter, I'm like, I wanted to talk about that. I'm sorry if it was uh, distracting from the main focus of things. But anyway, okay. So going back to Bonnie here, all right? Bonnie is trying to use her age-age powers on Saturn, but it won't work. Uh, she cannot manipulate Saturn's age. She can't turn Saturn into a baby and just like, he's like, ha-ha, you have been defeated. Uh, wouldn't that be funny, though, if Saturn turned into a baby, but it was like a little spider baby? <laughs> you know, like, that'd be interesting. But it's like, anyway, he's like, you owe that power to me, Bonnie. When you were just an infant, we experimented with devil fruits. We extracted the essence of a devil fruit by giving it to you through an infusion to see if you could do that without eating the fruit. Okay, so a couple of things. I, number one, Bonnie did not eat the devil fruit. That was something that was like, all right, we did not see her eat a fruit, so I don't think that happened, and it did not. Um, we could extract infusions and feed them to you that way without feeding them the fruit to you normally. So I'm not really sure what this means. If 
they mean like literally they just took like like a syringe into a devil fruit and like extracted like the fruit juice of a devil fruit and like you know intravenously gave that to bonnie when she was a baby or if it means like the essence of a fruit because as i've mentioned before devil fruits have to have some sort of like spirit or aura because they're, they they reincarnate right when a user dies it reincarnates somewhere else so that means when the user dies there has to be like the soul of the fruit that like leaves the body and migrates somewhere else to be reborn, right? There has to be some intangible force behind this or else it doesn't make any sense. Um, I likened it to like the coordinate from Attack on Titan kind of thing, right? So maybe Saturn's referring to that, like he removed the essence of the fruit and gave that to Bonnie, something like that. But Bonnie did not eat the devil fruit. She had the power given to her when she was a baby at Marijua, but she did not awaken the power. Like the first time she showed the ability was when she was six. Um, I like to think there was a delayed effect because of that. Because the fruit was given to her in an unusual way, she still received the power, but it took a while for the power to take hold, okay? Um, also, I don't think we've ever actually seen a baby eat a devil fruit, so maybe when you are a child, like, like that young, and you eat a fruit, maybe it's like, you know, your body, you don't activate the abilities right away because you're still learning how to, like, you know, walk and talk and stuff like that. Like, you don't know how to do anything yet, so maybe it's just, it takes a while for that reason as well. But anyway, um, we also learn about something else. Saturn says that her abilities are useless now because that devil fruit works with the uh, parallel dimensions, the parallel futures that you could see, okay? However, those change when you learn more about reality. Okay, so let me put it another way. Bonnie as a child is probably the the best recipient of this devil fruit because children have so much imagination and they have so much like like the whole world seems possible to them all these futures seem open to them on what they could achieve and what they could do and their imaginations are insane right so when bonnie imagines herself as the sun god nika it's like okay and then punch but the older that she gets and the more that like, you know, like, let me put it like, like Santa Claus, for instance, like Bonnie could be like, I'm Santa Claus, Bonnie, ho, 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 right? But if she gets older and she stops believing in Santa Claus, she won't be able to use that ability anymore. It's kind of like that, right? So it's like she's beginning to doubt the existence of the sun god. She's beginning to doubt Nika's existence or view it more as just a, a silly legend, a bedtime story that her dad told her and nothing more. And she's like, no, that's that's impossible, Saturn. Nika is real. I've been looking for him to save Dad, and 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 he's gonna save everybody, and he's the hope that's gonna enlighten the world. And then Saturn is just like, ah, yet your power is weakening, which means that you are doubting his existence. Now, this is gonna change because as soon as she realizes Luffy has the powers of the Sun God and goes into his awakening again, and Bonnie realizes that, she's gonna be like, wait a minute, Luffy is the Sun God. The Sun God does exist, and we might have a cool scene, I don't know, where Luffy uses Gear 5 and Bonnie can use the Nika power, but like even, you know, amped up more because she now knows that Nika exists. And then, boom, like, you know, dual attack together on Saturn. That could be cool. That could be really neat. Okay. Your father passed down a worthless buccaneer legend. He once told me he wanted to save people like the sun god. But your mother being brought to the Holy Land as wife number eight. It was really ironic. I, she ended up becoming part of my drug experiments and she ended up contracting that sapphire scale disease as a, as like all the other failures as a side effect. Okay. So we threw her out, right? Okay. And he also mentions, like, I didn't know that it would pass down to the child, though. All right, so he brings up Ginny as wife number eight. Now, the question is, is this Saturn's wife? All right. Now, you'd think that if Saturn being like 800 years old, he would have like a lot more wives than just eight. It's a messed up thing to think about, but that's how the Tenrobito operate, right? So if Saturn is like 800, 900 years old, you'd think he would be like in the triple digits by now, right? Uh, but maybe not, because he does view humans as insects. Maybe every once in a while he gets bored and is just like, oh yes, I'll take that woman over there, all right. And then after he's tired with her, he'll experiment on her. And then the, there's like a lot of failures, it seems, and then chuck them back down into the lower realm, right? That's a completely disgusting thing to do, but that's how the Tenerobe, that's what Saturn does specifically. He just experiments on people all the time, all right, from what we've learned. He he is the mad scientist of One Piece. That is even more so than Caesar. Like, like Saturn is worse by an order of magnitude, okay? Because uh, he's been doing this for 800 years and effectively rules the world, okay? 
So, I don't know yet. I think it's still out for debate whether or not Saturn and Ginny were, like, that was, that was his wife number eight that he was referring to. Because it's a little strange, like... The, the way I'm looking at this is like if it was another Tenryu Bito, like 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 let's say a, like Saint uh, like a Saint Roswald or somebody that got uh, Ginny instead, and just like like I want her, you know? Okay, well, there's your wife number eight. Well, it would be weird that Saturn would be referring to that other Tenryu Bito's as wife number eight. He doesn't say my wife number eight, but he says to be wife number eight. Seems to kind of be implying that it's his wife. Okay, now, a lot of people have also brought this up, too. They've mentioned, like, well, if Saturn was Ginny's, um, I, I hesitate to say husband and wife, because that's not the situation, but if, if that was the case with Saturn and Ginny, and then Saturn is, is Bonnie's biological father, then why would they allow Bonnie to leave Marijua? They would never have allowed Bonnie to leave. Well, the way I can look at that is, something that Saturn says right here, where he's like, look at it from my perspective. I, do you comprehend the feelings of insects you step on? Referring to all humans, even Bonnie. So from his perspective, Ginny was an insect, Bonnie was an insect. Even if Bonnie was his actual daughter, like the dude has lived for 800 years. Do you know how many children this guy has probably had? He doesn't give a shit about any of them. I don't think we're taking Saturn to be like, well, this was my daughter, so I will raise her to be the next evil overlord. Like, that's, I don't think, how the Gorosei operate. They're immortals. They do not care about having children and having them take over their position. They are essentially living forever. So they're like, yeah, he's like, you know, the, the, the sex slaves, the wives I have brought to Marijua, they are all insects to me. Any children I had with them are insects to me. The other ten Rubito are probably insects to me, and everybody on the lower realm is an insect to me. I am Saturn, you know. I am a Gorose, you know. Like that's the idea behind that. Behind that, at least the way I'm looking at it. But maybe Ginny wasn't even his uh, his uh, sex slave to begin with. It could have been another ten Rubito. So therefore, that means Bonnie is another ten Rubito's uh, biological daughter. But we just do not know yet. Okay. All right. At that exact moment when all hope is looking bad, we have like boom, a crash on Egghead, and the headliner is here, ladies and gentlemen. The PX Zero, formerly known as Bartholomew Kuma, has arrived on the island, and the Marines that are at the cordon are just like, "What happened here? What's going on?" And just like, "Bartholomew Kuma's at the port." And just like, "What?" And he's like, "Is it a pacifista?" No, he's got the paw pads. The horrible paw pads. And it's like, oh no. And so Kuma gets up and he just starts like just running, just quarterbacking his way, you know, through the crowd of Marines. And they're like, well, shoot him. And they're like, okay. And they just start unloading like bazooka rounds into Kuma. He's charging through the city. He's getting blasted in the face. He's already banged up from all the damage he incurred on the way here. Climbing the red port, getting attacked by a Kainu, sailing down and getting shot again. He's running straight through. They're, they're, the authority command ships aren't working, so that means he is beyond whatever kind of uh, control that Vegapunk ostensibly put in him. Because here's the thing, that necklace that um, Vegapunk gave to Bonnie, I think it was meant to activate when Bonnie, I, I, I'm assuming she's wearing it right now, it's just she's wearing like a high collar like outfit so we don't see it, but I'm assuming she's wearing the necklace that Vegapunk gave her from Kuma. And so maybe when Bonnie, maybe it was uh, set to activate during, um, you know, when it came in contact with her or something like that, like, you know, oh, 10th uh, birthday protocol has now been initiated, and Kuma is like, <laughs> and then he starts moving, right? Remember, when Vegapunk gave Bonnie that necklace, that was hours ago. That was like, I don't know what time this is taking place. It's in the afternoon. Uh, let's say it was like the dawn, like maybe 4 a.m. when she received it. Maybe that was the time on the other side of the world where Kuma activated, left Kamabaka, ascended the red line, and traveled. Using Kuma's ability of the pawpaw fruit, he can make a great distances. Him going from Kamabaka to Egghead in like the span of like 12 hours or some such like I could I could see that him doing that sure um you know if he was going like top speed right so maybe that's the case and so that was the uh, activation mechanism to get Kuma to go there and protect Bonnie okay when she received that necklace maybe it also is able to like sense her emotional situation right like like her situation that she's in after experiencing the memory bubble and then the BX the PX0 activates this would have also have been something that Vegapunk programmed in later uh, maybe he did it in a way that Saturn could not tell, or maybe he waited until 
what if what if uh, Vegapunk did this? What if after Kuma was turned into a PX Zero, Saturn examined him and was like, okay, everything checks out. And then after that, Vegapunk installed like a DLC into Kuma, <laughs> like like extra bonus content, and it was involving this necklace. Maybe who knows? Who knows? But anyway, um, he's running through the crowd. He's getting shot at, but he's still moving. At the same time, Bonnie, after realizing like her helplessness and her devil fruit has now even failed her. By the way, this ability is not the same thing like, uh, like when Bonnie says, I can't manipulate Saturn's age. It's not like with Blackbeard, when Blackbeard comes in contact with you, uh, you can't use your power at all. She could still use her power, but she couldn't affect Saturn with it. So that means Saturn probably has a completely separate ability that, like, he doesn't nullify Devil Fruit powers, but Devil Fruit abilities, like that, like, aging ability, don't work on him. It could also be just a crazy amount of hockey, right? It could just be, like, that could be what's keeping Sanji and Frankie frozen right now. Like, it's just a conqueror's hockey on a level that we have never seen before that allows him to be immune to all Devil Fruit abilities and uh, to, to freeze people, and, and in some cases is if they're weak enough just destroy their heads okay if they don't have enough conquerors hockey to protect them or whatever their heads just blow up now Sanji and Frankie are strong enough to resist that but they still can't move right okay so we have Kuma arriving and at that exact moment Saturn raises her up and is like shoot her men shoot her and so they all take aim to fire at Bonnie that's when Kuma reaches the plaza he targets all of the Marines and then fires dual lasers you know stopping the Marines in their tracks Saturn takes Bonnie throws her to the ground and Bonnie's like oh my goodness I'm it's over I can't stand it anymore you know I just like if I would just be better off gone you know it's like I just wish it would all end right here like she was literally reaching the point in her life where it's like I can't stand it anymore I just want it to end and then boom that's when Kuma arrives protects Bonnie, uh, Saturn goes to like pierce Bonnie with one of uh, his spider legs with like the thorn on the end of it, the big spike on the end of it. Uh, Kuma shows up at the last minute, stabs him in the back, protects Bonnie, and then she's like, Daddy! And so Kuma's there, He's his face is all cracked and broken and glitching out, just, Bonnie, happy birthday, you know. It's insane. And then I burped there a little bit. This is really intense. And then it's like, it's Bartholomew Kuma. Oh my God, he's here. And then Kuma, last scene of the chapter, reaches back, grabs Saturn's spider leg, and then just... And then just reaches back for the punch. The one punch. It even looks like he's charging hockey up in it. Like, initiating armament hockey protocol. And it's like, okay. And last scene of the chapter is just Bonnie, uh, she goes back to being a child and she's just crying on the ground. Kuma's like, Aah! and then Saturn is like, what? <laughs> Saturn's last shot is just like, huh? He's like, I did not expect this, what? Okay, so uh, this is the moment. Um, I think Kuma's body is going to die here, uh, protecting his daughter, protecting Bonnie. Uh, Kuma punching and fighting against Saturn is probably going to be enough of a distraction for him to release the control on Frankie and Sanji and everybody, so Sanji and everybody could get up and grab Bonnie and get the hell out of there. Kizuru might be helping them after he gets up. There might be a moment where they're all running away, because most of the Marines are knocked out at this point by Kuma blasting them with lasers, right? Some of the Vice Admirals would probably be able to move around. But there might be a moment where the Straw Hats are getting up, Luffy is like, okay, Luffy, it's like Frankie picks up Luffy, it's like, Luffy, it's time to go, we gotta get the hell out of here while this is going on, right? And so Bonnie's crying, she's a mess, and then they're getting out of there, and then, like, the Vice Admirals might arrive and be like, we'll stop you. And then maybe that's when Kizuru shows up, and Kizuru's like, no. I'm letting them get away. I'm helping them get away. Like, Kizuru might even have a moment with the Vice Admirals. If the Vice Admirals are, like, like, like listening to orders, it's like, look at that. Look at the demon dude that's a spider that's been ruling the world for 800 years that tried to kill a child. Is that who we take orders from? Is that what we're here to do as Marines? Like, I think that there's some, you know, some, like, I like it's like doll, you know, and the other vice admirals might be like, yeah, you're right, this is messed up, I did not sign up for this. And just like, yeah, we are dealing with, like, biblic biblical levels of, of good and evil, and this battle, like, Satan and gods and shit, we need to get out of there, okay? So, I think the marines might just go with Kizru on this one, they might free Sentamaru and get the hell out of there. Um, and then we'll see what's happening with the rest of the Straw Hats, like Nami and Usopp and everybody, and like Cypherpole, like what's up with, with like Stussy and Luchi, and like Luchi and uh, Zoro 
Toro are still having their fight, I guess. I'm going to say what's an update on that. Haven't seen that in a while. But yeah, Kuma's going to deal with Saturn, and it's probably going to result in him detonating. And I don't know if it's going to kill Saturn, but it's probably going to stagger him a little bit. Like, whoa! And then uh, Kuma's body is going to be gone. The pawpaw fruit is going to leave. It's going to reincarnate somewhere else. But we learned, we learned a lot of stuff in this chapter. We learned about some stuff involving the age age fruit. We learned about... Um, a little bit about Ginny and Bonnie uh, while they were at Marie Joie and how messed up Saturn was and how involved he was with all this. Um, Kuma being drawn to Bonnie through his instinct, which is probably connected to that necklace in some way. Let me talk about that necklace here. I just thought of something, okay? So recently in One Piece, there's been a lot of interesting uh, iconography going on uh, and like symbolism and stuff. So I, I want to go over this stuff with you, okay? So this is the symbol of the paw. Okay, uh, which is indicative of Kuma because he has his paw pads, right? It's like the one big dot and then the three other dots. Uh, this is also very similar to the hoof of the celestial dragons, which bears a similar motif. Now, if you add more dots around that circle, you get the sun symbol, which is the symbol we saw at the church, and it's the symbol we saw on the necklace. Okay, so the paw becomes the sun. And it's also not unlike the world government sigil, which is the five dots, one in the center and four in the each cardinal direction connected by the line. Dude, how cool would it be if at the end of One Piece, when Dragon, uh, his revolution occurs, and the Tenerobito system and the Garosei and Eam finally fall, the world government remains, because he said that. Like, I don't want to dismantle the whole world government, like the whole infrastructure of the government and the Marines. I just want to get rid of the Tenrubito and the Gorosei and everything. And now Eam, now that Dragon knows Eam exists. Okay, what if after all of that is said and done, at the end of One Piece, the world government gets a new sigil, a new logo, and it goes from this to this. And that is the new sigil of the world government, the sun symbol that we see here in the necklace that's similar to the paw, and that shines down over the whole world. I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. All right, so maybe we could do that. I'm just bringing it up because I'm noticing a lot of similarities between like the paw symbol and the hoof of the celestial dragon symbol and the necklace and the sun. It's like, oh, this is all, these are all very similar like art that Oda's drawing here in terms of symbology and stuff. So this is all going to connect back to something, right? Well, anyway, a lot of stuff to unpack here, but we got a break until the next uh, chapter is released, of course. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you have a very happy end of 2023, happy new year and everything like that. Uh, this will be Teching 101 signing out. Later, everyone. See you next year.